Older Students, this is Dr. John Schrocki, and I am welcoming you at this time to our course, The Science of Climate Change. And I wanted to show you something very special that I think is going to help you understand a real theme that we're going to have this semester in this class. Now, as some of you know, I don't actually even live in the Omaha area. I actually live in Indiana. And I'm going to have another video for you in the coming weeks where you're going to find out about that whole situation and how the course is going to work and so on. But I live in Evansville, Indiana, and this is the church that my family and I go to. It's Holy Redeemer Church in Evansville, Indiana. And this is a special place for a number of reasons, but one of the things about it is the strange architecture of this building. This is not a lot like a typical Catholic church. I mean, it has some of the things that you expect in a typical Catholic church, like artwork and so on. There's a lot of the candles and the altarpieces and so on that you expect. But in many ways, it's a much more plain building than you normally expect a Catholic church to be. Uh, it doesn't even have stained glass windows. In fact, here in town, one of the things people know about Holy Redeemer Church is the strange architecture. There isn't a right angle in this building. If you look at what I'm showing you here, you'll see how there are strange angles, how all the different parts come together. The floor isn't even level. A building like this costs millions of dollars to make, and the architect went to school for a long time. When they have made a building that looks like this, it's for a reason. The architect was trying to tell us something, and I think the lesson that the architect is trying to teach us is actually going to tell us something important about the Science of Climate Change course. Bear with me for a moment. So this is where my family and I tend to sit. We tend to sit on the north side of the church in one of these pews near the back, and that's just because I have naughty children, and they will need to be taken out the back and so on. And we always sit over here. And when people hear that we go to Holy Redeemer, they say, oh, yeah, that's that church with the strange building with all the weird angles and so on. And I say, yes. In fact, it's so strange. It has so many details to how it was built. The architect even hid in the architecture of the building the fact that, like, the building isn't even symmetric, which is a weird detail. When have you ever been in a church that wasn't symmetric, right? But if you sit right here, you can clearly see that like on either side of the altar, there are these sort of beige panels and the fabric panels back there. The speakers for the speaker system are behind those kind of beige panels that I'm showing you. And if you take a look at the ones on the north side of the church and on the south side of the church, they're not the same size. The architect clearly for some reason has hidden the fact, they're, they're close, but they're not the same size. And when you actually even look a little more closely, for example, see how above each of the beige panels there are four lights? And here on the north side, the four lights are actually spaced closer together, whereas on the south side of the church, they're spaced farther apart. And the architect is hiding the fact that the building is not quite symmetric by hiding it within all these angles and so on. Again, I'm not quite sure what the architect was trying to say, but I very firmly believe in what the architect was trying to say, that there is some reason for this, whether it's a, a church reason or whether it is uh, about the acoustics of the building, the architect is hiding a message in here about how he made this place work. And I firmly believe that. And I sit here every Sunday on the north side of the church, and I see this. And I've told that story many times. And then one Sunday, the north side of the church had those little bows on the end of the pew that said reserved. Something was going on, Knights of Columbus or something. Something was going on over here. And I had to sit on the south side. And once you're over here on the south side, everything changes. It turns out once you sit over here on the south side of the church, everything you thought you knew about the building on the north side of the church is wrong. See the beige panel over here by the crucifix? It's small. Look at the beige panel over there by the choir. It's big. It's much wider. Look at the lights above the beige panel above the crucifix. They're close together. The, panel, the lights above the choir are far apart. Everything you thought you knew about the architecture of the building just depended on where you were looking at it, your perspective on the building. In fact, it isn't until you leave your seat, your comfy place where you are, and go stand in the middle that you realize the building's symmetric. It's exactly the same size on either side. It was purely about your perspective that made you think you knew what it looked like. But you don't. But there's a problem. 
there's only one place in the building you can be where you get a sense of what the building really looks like, and that's right here in the middle. But you know where nobody is? Right here in the middle. Right here in the middle, there are no pews. Right here, where you could actually know what is the objective reality of what the building actually looks like, is not where you get to be. Everybody comes in here with their own perspective, where they sit and where the angle they see things from. And your perspective and somebody on the outside's perspectives are equally valid. And it does not make your opinion any, it doesn't in any way diminish your opinion of what the building looks like to acknowledge that somebody else sitting someplace else is seeing it differently. In fact, that's the only way without being in the middle of the building to understand the objective of reality of what this place looks like. The only way to understand what it looks like is to take into account other people's perspective. Sitting from one place, you have no way of knowing what the building really looks like. It's only by acknowledging and recognizing and valuing the other perspective that you get a sense of what the reality of the building is like. But it's not that simple either. It might sound like I'm telling you that from whatever place you are at, your opinion is valid and however you think it looks is right. But that's not exactly the way it works either because there are ways to do this wrong. When I'm sitting here on the north side of the church, I could have said the people on the south side of the church are lying to me about what they see, or it's a conspiracy to trick me about what they see, or that they don't, there's no way to know what the building really looks like. And those are all intellectual dead ends. There's nothing to go with that opinion. If I'm telling you the way I see it from the north side of the church is the right way, and the other people are lying or it's a conspiracy or something like that, what do I do with that information? There's, I, I now have said, I can't know how this building really works and I can't trust how other people do it. The conversation's over. There's no way then to know what the real objective reality of what the building is can be done. It's only by accepting having a shared set of facts about what the different perspectives are that you can actually gain real knowledge of the real nature of the building. Well, the metaphor with this and climate change is a little bit heavy handed and so on. I mean, clearly, you know people with different perspectives on the subject of climate change. There are people who feel one way and people who feel another. And what I'm telling you is that's both okay and not okay. It is okay to have different opinions about the nature of the problem and what we should be doing about it, as long as you're operating within a shared set of facts. If you accept the point of view of others, if you operate within a shared set of facts, the, the range of opinions is in fact the only way to get to a closer approximation to the objective reality of what's going on in climate and climate change. In fact, the primary way you can do it wrong is by denying that we can know or by claiming that it's a conspiracy or by claiming that the people on other sides are lying to you. That's an intellectual dead end. There's no place to go with that. That's the only way to do it wrong. You undoubtedly know people who bring different perspectives to the issue of climate change. I want you to start thinking as we go into the semester about where does, does their opinion fit in all of this. Are they working within an, a shared set of facts that is leading us through the diversity of opinions towards some kind of understanding of what's really going on? Or are they rejecting the notion that other people are telling them the truth, that it's some kind of conspiracy, or that there is some kind of truth that we can even know? Well, that's an intellectual dead end. There's no place to go with that. Start thinking about that as we go into the semester. This business of different perspectives and the value that each of those brings is going to be a theme in our semester. We're going to start seeing about the perspectives that different professions bring to the subject of climate change, like oceanography, or meteorology, or climatology, or economics, or politics, or so on. But we're also going to be seeing how the opinions of non-experts and the rejection of the nature of understanding these kind of things kind of leads us astray into intellectual dead ends. 
All right, I wanted to give you that as a little bit of a thing to start thinking about before our semester starts. I hope that you have a wonderful Christmas break, and I look forward to our upcoming semester.